what role do you think tall buildings can play in combating China's air quality crisis or similar air quality crisis right, right, across right. the world? I, th I think that's a really interesting question because you, you don't instinctively think of tall buildings as um, having a, a, an impact on air quality, but actually th they have it from a number of aspects. Uh, you can look at it from a, a case of just density. You're, you're moving people into one location and it's going to attract public transport and people will use cars less, in theory. So that's, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect is that as we design tall buildings, they tend to you know, have very good facades, uh, very good mechanical systems, and so consequently the, the energy use intensity of, of a super tall building is, is going to be relatively low. Do you think the role of green walls or sky gardens or incorporating I, nature into I think skylines it's, is this? I, th I think that having green space inside buildings is, is very important and, and I do believe that perhaps on podiums and what have you there's a very good role for greenery on the outside of a building. I just think that you have to be a little bit careful with it and it shouldn't just be seen as you know a green adornment so to speak. Um, so we've seen net zero buildings on a small scale. We're starting to see more even carbon right. neutral buildings. What most are the most promising technologies that might enable a net zero skyscraper in the future? Do you think that's even possible? I do. I, I do think it's possible um, if we can start to to look at technologies uh, using perhaps geothermal heat exchange or into, into seasonal thermal storage in the ground. It's not going to suddenly happen. It's going to happen incrementally. And you know, somebody's going to say, "Well, these guys did that, and you know, it costs so much. Um, we've learned the lessons from that, and we can do do it a lot cheaper." And then you make another step, and so it's kind of little, really baby steps. But I, I absolutely believe it's. Possible. What do you think tall building uh, designers need to do that they're not doing already to address disaster resilience, climate resilience? Um, one of the, the, the outcomes of climate change may, may, be, may be that cities or parts of cities are no longer relevant for the function that they were originally designed. So, for example, you may have a whole load of offices in, in a place where, for one reason or other, due to climate change, it may no longer be the right place to have offices. So you might want to think of perhaps could these bu buildings be converted to residential properties? So that kind of resilience, I, yeah. I don't think is, is happening. You know, people are not thinking, well, could I punch a hole in my floor if I needed to, you know, make this a, 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 a I don't know, two-story apartment or something like that. Right. So that's kind of a little bit more abstract, but, but you can see how it happens. I mean, patterns of city use do change through time. And, and often that's the drivers for that, are, you know, sea level rise, a port comes or a port goes away or, agricultural land becomes, you know, agricult agricultural industry diminishes and there's all kinds of reasons why cities change sh size and shape. And we talked about net zero earlier on a building scale, but let's talk about it on a city scale or a society scale right. even. Um, I mean, you, you've planned with Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill net zero cities from the ground up like Mazda. Right. Um, what lessons can be applied from this kind of experience, these planning experiences? Um, to the real world where politics, economics, there are all these harder to predict things that might, yeah. might change the equation. So I, I guess we, we, we do have a, a whole opportunity to build our way out of this, but we can't do it just on our own. It, it has to be um, through collaboration with the supply chain and, and unfortunately because we have no real control of them, we also have to work with the legislators to, to start bringing in Ben benchmarks and minimum standards for some of these things that we, we might not have included before. I mean, Leeds taking lead, you know, USGBC lead programs, taking it, baby steps in, into doing this with the, the new version four, looking at life cycle analysis. Yeah. Other rating systems have, have had that in place for a little while longer. Um, so, uh, y you know, I think these are going to be interesting times over the next five years and see how, how this pans out. I, I think. I think that generally there's an acceptance that we have to. So we have to start looking at the overall, more holistic global impact that we have on, on the environment, not just on, hey, let's save some energy and have a net energy positive building. I mean, I can have a, a net energy positive building that, that actually the embodied carbon, well, ov obviously the embodied carbon is going to be everything in that case, but the embodied carbon of a net energy positive building is going to be way, 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 way higher than the embodied carbon of a perhaps close to net energy positive buildings. So the, the, the first step is, is to just, you know, take this leadership position and start evaluating the, the whole um, environmental impact of, of the materials that we're selecting, not just how they can save you operational energy, but how they can perhaps use, be used to reduce embodied 
carbon of the overall building.